and great to have Phil alongside me virtually, the photographer, because this, the, uh, one of the nice things for me about, about this collaboration is that the photographs and the poems were, they were, they do work in tandem exactly like Aaron was, was saying, but um, they were made um, decades apart. <laughs> <laughs> so the images, and Phil's going to say a bit more about the images as we go through. We're going to read three poems from, from the book, but the images were all taken in, in one month, I believe, in, in 1968 in the city of Dundee. And um, the book came about through a kind of pub conversation where Phil and I got together. Phil was, was showing uh, the images in a, an exhibition, wonderful exhibition called Mono 68. And uh, we were talking about poetry and photography and the way it, it can work together. And um, Phil gave me um, about 90 odd prints of these, these fantastic monochrome images. And just let me sort of go off and, and spend time with them. So I did that and I, I spent a lot of time looking and it's a real, it's such a pleasure really to be able to do that, just have these things. And it felt very secret and wonderful having these images just there to spend time with. And, and I wanted to make something happen and something did start to happen. And the story that came to me was about a, a, a city, an imaginary city. Um, and in this imaginary city, I had these images that were sort of started to speak to each other, for me anyway. And <clears throat> the idea came to me of telling the story of this imaginary city, beginning with its end, or beginning with an ending for that city, let me put it that way, and telling the story of its renewal, and really two attempts at renewal in some ways. And so that's, that's it in a nutshell. There is a sequence of poems here, poems and images that tell the story, beginning with the end, the first end <laughs> of this city. And it therefore deals as a sequence, I suppose, with issues of, or ask questions about urban desolation, about, about migration, about the way spaces are used and reoccupied, often with misunderstandings and half understandings about past purposes. And it, the sequence sort of plays with time and concertina's time in different ways. So it's, it, there's a kind of anachronistic warp to the whole, to the whole thing. Um, so we're going to do three poems uh, and I'm going to, Phil, would you like to, before we read, actually, do you want to say something about the images more generally before we come to each, each of these? Yes, I, I think that would be good. I mean, I, it kind of feels as if I, in, in almost all of it, I was uh, photographing my own past. It, uh, you talk about warp and that sort of truncating of time is quite a fascinating issue in its own right. I mean, you had to edit with every press of the shutter in those days. It was, you know, you had to be sort of ready for the story. It wasn't a question of fast edit. It wasn't a question of thousands of frames and then you go away and take a look at it. And you had to be ready. And uh, I think in the first of these photographs, it hasn't come up yet, uh, the funeral, um, I was roaming. Uh, I was pretty good at lurking in those days. Um, and this is, it just felt like it was a story of student life, uh, you know, in a parallel world to the city itself. It's almost as if the student uh, fraternity didn't really touch the city and wasn't necessarily particularly aware of what was going on around it. They were so preoccupied with themselves. And this particular opening uh, could have been a closing because it certainly was a, a kind of metaphor for the way we, we, we viewed uh, uh, what was around us, the, the student-led uh, march and, and parade. It felt not like a parade at all. Uh, and uh, yeah, she were ready for it. There were several images, that particular one captured for me, uh, the preoccupation uh, with themselves, really. 
So it's coming up now. Yeah, let's have a look. Uh, yeah, we can do a real. I was particularly kind of moved by what was going on because I, I felt that I needed to try and see something from the outside, but you were constantly drawn in because you were a student yourself at the time. So uh, this particular one just, uh, yeah, kind of half covered at the moment that, that uh, it all started for me when I was uh, roaming the city. Yeah. And this was a, it was, it was the rag society, wasn't it? They were, they were raising money, weren't they? They were raising money. I mean, they've got a kind of mock Latin phrase, give us a tana. And of course that was, you know, a tana was a tana, a, a sixpence. Uh, but it was all sort of couched in this kind of joke. And uh, people did respond to it, but there was another side to it as you looked around and, and watched the way the parade wove its way through some of those streets. Mm. So I, I found this image really compelling and and so suggestive in so many ways. So this this sort of quite quickly for me became the place to start the story of Balanuv. And I should say probably something about the name of this imaginary city, which I imagine to be somewhere in Britain, kind of parallel universe, if you like. Um, Balanuv, I, I decided I wanted to do something that honoured that connection to, to Scotland. Uh, that comes obviously from the fact that these images are taken in Dundee. So um, uh, I, I wanted to bring together uh, something from, from Scots Gaelic. So Bala Nuv is actually an anglicisation of uh, Scots Gaelic for holy city, Bala Nuv, two words in Scots Gaelic. So I put those together and that's where the name, the name came from. So I'll start with uh, the funeral. It begins with a funeral, the dead city laid in its Sunday best under bleached white cloud. Its people are shadows pinned to the ground. They have come out to see this last parade of Andalusian black and wedding day light. The undertakers in top hats, tails and shades carry the cardboard coffin and the weightless cargo of the city's soul shaking cans, collecting for the ferryman and the cold promise of escape. Only one bearer is honestly sad, eyeing the children who wait so well behaved for a float to bring music and sweets, while the grown-ups, afraid, revert to blind reflex and clump at a church. It is locked. The dismantling of the high rise is halfway done, and the chimneys of last century line up for absolution. Those who oversee the end are young. They have made their final ritual fun. So the story progresses, and um, we're moving on now to a time when the city that is that is devastated and abandoned is starting to be reoccupied and a new kind of government forms essentially and this first this first government there's lots of exploration that goes on between that poem and this poem we're we're looking at now and this image we're looking at now um, but things start to go wrong um, and essentially a kind of absolutism sets in. One of the other things that the, the book explores is, is the relationship between public and private, if you like, state authority and the public realm. Um, and uh, education, I suppose, uh, the idea of education, who controls education, how that relates to the idea of cultural renewal and that constant process of cultural regeneration that that any healthy culture has to participate in. Um, so that's all running through all this. So before I say any more about the context in Balanuv, again, I'm gonna invite Phil to, to say something about this, this wonderful image, which again was just one that immediately leapt out to me when I was first looking through the exhibition photographs. Well, the, uh, the, the school playground 
became an absolute mecca for you know interest and, and diversity of things going on the whole time. And, and I, it might be worth pointing out that this little fellow could easily have been me 20 years before because most of the environment hadn't really changed. And I think, I was, as I say, I was kind of photographing through uh, those, that, that type of, uh, if you like, metaphysical lens. I wanted to concentrate on the girl, uh, and the, the, her contraption, of course, and, and that, the disapproving janitor. But uh, the boy in the stripes, he, he kind of suddenly appeared and froze uh, in front of me. It was one of those very strange moments. I, um, I, I, I suddenly the focus of attention had changed, and I thought, okay. And then he put his hand up. Uh, and I knew that, that was it. I just had to grab that moment. We were dealing with twin lens reflex. Uh, you know, it was a Yashica 635, it was 12 frames. It was wet process. So you really didn't have too much time. You knew you had to make up your mind on the spot. And uh, this is what happened with that. But none of the characters, uh, none of the three characters spoke to me. Uh, none, none, none of them said a word. And I kind of slunk away as soon as a shutter was pressed and moved on to other uh, other things. But um, what was left uh, in that glare of the sunshine uh, was the sunlight was a kind of odd moment. Um, nothing particularly explained. Yeah, I think it was that 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 air of unexplainedness. <laughs> that, that really kind of appealed to me actually and again it became part of the mood for the whole for the whole book the whole idea that I conceived you know the story that came out of of these um the, just, like I said the suggestiveness of, of it and again you know as Phil's saying but the, it's, it's it's kind of important to call to mind that the materiality of that photographic process that Phil's been talking about but I think one of the things that's so astonishing for me about these images is that they've been through that that whole sort of multi-stage process, that physical process, which photographic development involved, you know, when Phil took these photos in, in 68. So, so anyway, all of that, again, we're going to transmogrify it back to the Balanouve and this particular moment in the story. Like I said, when things have gone wrong, really. The salute. The school caretaker is a party informant. He has come to ask this black-haired girl, the most dangerously forward intellectual of her year, what she is doing with that four-cupped spinning contraption out here in the yard during lunch hour. I made it to measure the wind, she replies. He says nothing, but ponders, what kind of a plot is that? So he asks how on earth she could think that the white leather boots that she wears could be fit and proper attire. She goes shy. They're my favourite, she says, and fiddles with a strange device. Just then a boy turns up, four hours late. The caretaker looks but the boy walks by, straight into the teacher that all the kids hate. Where have you been, boy? What time do you call this? My ma'am, he begins. I don't want your excuses. The wave of the hand. The caretaker watches. The teacher leans in. Remember, boy, you are here by the will of the state and you still haven't learned to salute. So things move on again. And um, I wanted to pick, a, a, pick a, a poem and an image from the kind of third phase or a later phase, at least of the story, where a kind of new recovery is underway. So things change, things move, move on again from that kind of <laughs> rather oppressive environment that just evoked in that previous poem. And um, the artists have a lot to do with this. Because <laughs> again, one of the things that sort of just came out of the process of, of making this, this book 
for me in this sequence was, was the role of art, thinking about the role of art, the idea of art, what art does, um, what it's for and kind of fundamental ways. So these kind of big, you know, scary questions that we don't allow ourselves to ask too, too often. I, uh, I want, you know, I wanted to spend a bit of time with that. And um, again, I wanted to relate that to this idea of renewal uh, and, and of cultural renewal and what, what freedom really means. What, what liberty is, you know, these words that have become kind of tarnished with age, but need to be kind of scrubbed fresh and be renewed themselves, really. So this is from that later phase. And um, again, it was an image that um, I just immediately kind of loved when I saw it. Um, and uh, spoke to me <laughs> in so many ways and I tried to, I suppose what, I didn't necessarily consciously do this, but when I was working on the poem, um, I wanted, I suppose, uh, fundamentally to, my impulse was to get all of those feelings into this, into this, this poem about um, uh, daringly called the artist. <laughs> um, but, but uh, as ever, there's, there's another, story the story of what really happened in 68 there so phil do you want to say something about about this image yes well it's one of my favorites really in, insofar as that it's been relatively easy to photograph what uh, this painter was actually uh, doing a painting you know the actual image itself his name was uh, and i can still recall it was jock alexander um i don't know why but that was his name and uh, he never spoke to anyone, and, and I felt there was no point in me engaging him. Um, to put it in context, I was surrounded in those days at, at art college by mysterious people all painting inside their heads. Uh, they didn't really engage with you much. It was in their eyes, you could see it. Um, so I didn't quite stalk him, but I was. the, the studios were pretty labyrinthian, and you could you could basically lose yourself in there and find anything of interest that you wanted. And I decided a reflection, um, it made more sense, at least it was not going to be noticed. Uh, and it, therefore the camera would have its own life without any kind of, if you like, artificiality creeping in. So yes, yet again, I was lucky. <laughs> and uh, you had to know your moment uh, as, as ever, it was it was impossible to to know you'd got it right, but there was always a timing factor in it, and uh, this particular one compositionally worked for me. Um, and said all kinds of things about the portal, about the the engagement, the preoccupation with the, the, the medium, if you like. So uh, yeah, I there were several, but this one, uh, the milk the milk bottle, the the old uh, weighing machine that all just fitted together. It's quite, it's quite geometric in its own way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and like quite a few of the images that, uh, well, from the exhibition as a whole, Mono 68, the exhibition that, you know, I, I, I selected the images from, there's, there's lots of interesting sort of things, just things there that you don't, don't necessarily know what they're for. Like that, that thing just in front of the, the sort of piece of mirror there, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a kind of stand, I guess, but anyway, you can speculate and there's, and there's room for speculation in the images themselves. So again, I just think, you know, the, the, the sort of photographic achievement of, of these, these images was just so, uh, it kind of worked very powerfully uh, on me. Um, and so right, again, bringing it back, uh, for this final one, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna read now, um, where things, things start to look, look up a bit, <laughs> in, in some ways, for, for Balanu, um, with this piece, the, the artist. He's intent. He could be Goya in his roll neck jumper. The light is as cold as the air of an ice house. His canvas is tilted to collect it. He is caught in the luminous panel of his art. He can pass through the mirror only to paint. 
to cross that threshold of will, to inhabit that second fate for hours on end requires utmost devotion. The way through is narrow, but leaks like a riddle. On this side, the broken scales that once weighed the soul are abandoned. An offering of milk is left half drunk. The spirits are fickle tonight. He feels the urgency of his task to hold the present and the future open. He must.